Whitetail Cribs, Knock On Nation. I'm John Dudley and... Yep, John Dudley, 45 time top three medalist in archery, world renowned archer, owner of Knock On, and you get to see the first ever exclusive look at his trophy room, brought to you by Whitetail Cribs. Here we go. Right here is something I think a lot of you guys have seen. This is my, what I refer to as my school. This is where I do a lot of my training, a lot of my work with a lot of my students here, do most of my indoor training here. Uh, you can look around. So uh, there's really no rhyme or reason to any of this stuff. Um, I'm not much on mounting things, if I'm honest, and I'm not real big on scoring things either. Uh, but I love pictures and honestly, I love doing Europeans and telling the story. So up here, a couple elk, a couple goats and stuff like that. Some mule deer. Out of all the mule deer, these are two that I mounted, uh, mainly because this one right here was just the widest mule deer I've ever shot. But to be honest with you, I was hunting whitetails. So that's what's hilarious about it. Uh, my tag was good for whitetails or mule deer, and I was totally expecting deer. And this sucker ended up stepping out on this alfalfa field. And honestly, at first, I didn't even know there were mule deer where I was at. So when that thing came out, I thought I just saw the world record whitetail when his head first came over that berm. But uh, just a super wide, crazy buck, and he was still in velvet. So I'm pumped about that. This mule deer here uh, was another one that I mounted, mainly because this mule deer was a hunt that I did with one of my closest buddies, and he had gone through a little bit of a little bit of a downtime during COVID, lost a family member, uh, and I wanted to cheer him up. So I ended up booking a double mule deer hunt and brought him with me. And crazy enough, I chased this buck for about five days before I, before I finally got an arrow in him. I arrowed this buck and as soon as I was there, my buddy actually sent me a text that said, I'm on a stock right now on a big buck and we loaded this guy up and we just hauled butt to try to catch my buddy. He was probably about six to 10 miles away as a crow flies. And uh, as we rolled up on him, we were able to literally watch him make his shot on this stock, which was awesome. And what was so cool about it is his buck is an identical twin to this. So both of our bucks were exactly the same, matching flyers on the inside right there. Uh, so we both got these things mounted. That way I could always remember having that cool opportunity to make him smile when he needed it. So uh, that's that. The elk, kind of the way my elk work is once these, if these elk get beat, then they come down and they just kind of rotate out. I don't have a lot of space. And uh, I think for those of you who are knock on followers and who have ever had one of our bow grips or our knives done or anything where they're made with antler, I use different mounts or different Europeans of mine as they get beat out by new ones coming in. Uh, we go ahead and recycle that antler to all of you. So that's pretty cool. Uh, lots of cool elk here. This is a pretty cool, uh, this is a mountain grizz. Love the claws on these things, and this bear has such a cool story. I had hunted Grizz for, I think, 60-something days. Just never got an opportunity, never got an opportunity, and then I was in this shop working on one of Joe Rogan's bows, heavy poundage, short draw-length draw bow. I was shooting it, sighting it in, and that's when my shoulder detonated. So I had to go in and get a full re shoulder rebuild. So I ended up having to use a mouth tab for two black bears and this grizz. Something that was really, really cool about this grizz is uh, when we got up to him, he's a little bit thin, but his skull was pretty awesome. And when we started caping him, we actually found there was actually an old snare around his hide. And he was also missing one claw. So the theory is that he had actually got his head in a snare. And when he backed up and it started to pull, he got that one claw in there and ended up giving him enough space when that claw got cut off that he could somewhat live with that. 
Um, so he was missing a claw, had a snare around his neck. The skull told a different story. And what was really cool about this is the area that this bear came from. The buddy I was with, his dad told a story of a hunter that he had came, that came from either Germany or somewhere like that. And this hunter was just dead set on one shot, one kill. And I kept telling him on a grizz, shoot until I tell you not to shoot. He ended up finding a grizz, made one shot, dropped the grizz on the spot. And he turned to the guide, held the shell up and said, I told you one shot, one shot. And then Bert looked and said, your bear's running away, shoot him again. So this guy racked another one, shot again, rolled this bear and they ended up never finding him. The skull has a 338 round right through the molars on this side and came out the jaw here and blew this jaw apart. And there was one calloused uh, 338, big callous spots on both sides where you'd hit them straight through the gut. When we're trying to put all the stories together, we think that this is the bear that got shot twice, went down, knocked him out, punched him through the, through the abdomen and ended up going into a den and living it out. So this dude has a, an awesome, awesome story. Uh, this is a Shiras. Waited a long time for a Shiras bull. Got this Shiras and thought that it'd be a cool little mount to put here. Through the years, people have asked me about, can I please see your trophy room? Honestly, I love hunting for myself. That's who I am. So I normally don't show any of this. So Whitetail Cribs, you are the first. I guess you guys probably should just look around. Um, I don't score my whitetails. There's a few I know the score just based on either the story or if I thought it was, you know, hitting that 200 mark. But in here, just a lot of really, really cool bucks. And honestly, photos and skulls are my thing. That buck up there is actually uh, a pretty dang cool story. That buck right there is one of the first deer I killed in Iowa. I actually was coaching a Christian youth camp, drew an Iowa tag, came down, and the camp director was kind of taking me hunting. I had a couple spots where I went, and just things weren't working out, never saw a deer, people coming. This particular hunt, I came back and this guy said, listen, I've got to stand. And he said, he goes, even a girl could hunt out of it because a girl had hunted out of it. So he told me where this stand was. I really wanted to hunt with a decoy. So I was carrying my decoy, had my backpack, and I went out to this stand where he told me it was. And I'm walking across this wide open alfalfa field. All of a sudden I look over on this CRP edge that's probably about a hundred yards away and I just see that rack just looking over the grass and I just kind of froze. And next thing I know, he just comes popping out of that grass, got his hair all bristled up. You know, I'm just sitting there with the decoy, don't know what to do. I'm in, a, in an alfalfa field. So I ended up setting the decoy down and leaning it against my body. And I took my backpack off and I had to get out my release, got my release out, got an arrow on the string, kind of held the decoy up and peeked over him. And here he is 50 yards still coming in. And I get my bow over the top of the, well, actually the first time I tried just setting the decoy up, he was standing and now he's 25 or less. Ears back, bristled up. I go to pull my bow back and now I cannot get my body close enough because the decoy is right between us. So I ended up having to go three quarter draw and I just waited till he was about seven yards and just looked down my arrow and sent it right into him. So that was a really, really cool one. This was a deer, I had hunted Kansas uh, for several years, never saw a deer. I was hunting by myself. What's funny is I went to this place, a buddy had called me and said, hey, I've got a place you can come if you put in again. And I was very reluctant because this was, at this time I had had 159 hours in a stand in Kansas, never saw a deer. I get to this place and my buddy is there with a bunch of his other buddies who I guess were all on this lease together. And it became pretty apparent that none of them really knew that he had invited someone. 
after they all drew straws, he came over and he said, listen, we're all, we're all going after this one buck. The guys just want you to go to a different farm. They end up dropping me off on this gravel road and it's a one mile section to a fence line in the back. There was no crop. It was picked lentils. Like I'm talking nothing but dirt. Like this is the worst spot ever, right? And sure enough, right before dark, I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna hit these antlers together and just, you know, see what happens. And I started rattling and all of a sudden I looked and I could just see these tines. And when I saw that flyer, I knew that was a deer they were all after. He ended up coming. I tried to, I had to pull back level with the sky like this and then fish my bow through all this locust. And I had one hole about that big around to the ground. And he came in and nosed all around my tree and then finally turned and walked right into that hole and I shot. He had literally made about three bounds and tipped over dead. And I went back to dinner that night. Not a single person asked me how I did. They all were picking their spots for the next day. And honestly, I was just like, okay, this was awkward. I, I just felt like I didn't belong there or wasn't invited. I ended up going outside. I was going to field dress this dude and everything. And they all went out to have some cigars. And uh, one of them, as I was walking away, just said, well, how'd you do, do Dudley? And I go, pretty good. I mean, it's a pretty sweet buck. And they all looked over. And when they saw that 14 inch tine with that flyer, it changed the vibe of the party pretty fast. But hey, they were all now being able to hunt. So that's the story of this buck. What's cool about him is uh, he grossed just over 160 inches as a gross. I killed him on the 161st hour. So I wrote an article using this buck called An Inch An Hour. And what I said was, even though I'd gone 159 hours without ever seeing a deer, if I knew that that was the program I was on, I would have gladly went another week to get a 200 if that was the program. So, but I'm totally happy with one of the biggest, longest tined eight points that I've ever seen. So this, this elk right here, such an awesome story. Uh, so I had this side measured, um, this, this side and the spread, if this side match and if the spread is what it is, this would have been a 400 typical bull. I took this elk, I needed to get, get him caped and get this skull taken care of right away. It was pretty hot. And I went into this taxidermist and as he's holding this, this elk skull, and just admiring how ridiculous this side is, he noticed this swoop right here, which is very distinctive. And he said, I've held that shed before. He goes, no, I've held the other side of this elk's antler. And I said, what, where's the shed at? And he said, this old hermit way out of town has it. The story is that this bull and another bull got into a huge fight in this guy's alfalfa field. And the other bull completely ripped the antler and pedicle out of this bull's skull. And so I went to the farmer's place and sure enough, there it is right there. You can totally tell. And there is half the pedicle that actually still sits in this bull's skull right here. This was the only shed this farmer had ever found. So he did not want to sell it. What I did for three years is every time I got a paycheck, I would call this local bar in this small town and I would ask him to give a six pack to this guy when he came in. And then every year when I drove through, I would stop by and see it. This took me five years. So this completes the story of this bull, which was super, super cool. This is a big old coastal bear that I shot up, in, up on the peninsula in Alaska, Chignik Bay. And by the way, everything you see in here is all archery. Well, welcome to my dojo. This is, I call it the dojo. Some, some of my people at work call it the bojo, but this is pretty much where I go and where I'm at the majority of the time. Uh, a lot of times if some of the guys from the team need to meet, 
they come out here, this is my spot, but this is where I pretty much do everything that I like. I can come in here and I've got everything that makes me happy in one place. We are in the theater room. So this is the theater room. In here is kind of where some of the bigger bucks live. Um, there's a few in here. I'll give you a quick rundown. This is a really cool buck I shot. This is one of the few that I had someone score because I actually thought I'd got a 200. Just missed it, gross. But what I loved about that buck was I actually, that year, did not put any cameras out. I had no idea what I was hunting. And when this buck came in, I actually grunted him. And uh, I grunted, next thing I know, he, he just started coming. And the only thing I saw, honestly, the only thing I saw was that side. So um, when I shot him, I called a buddy of mine and I said, yeah, I think I'd I think I just shot a pretty cool buck. I said, probably mid 140. I said, he looked like an eight point, maybe with a kicker on one of his G2s or something. I said, it kind of happened fast. So I'm not really for sure. When he came and we trailed it together, he just looked at me. He's like, dude, that is not a 148 pointer. And he really isn't. He's pretty cool. You guys, I'm sure they'll give you a closer look to him, but he had like over 30 something inches of just eye guards alone. This is a, a Boone and Crockett six by six. I know that. This buck actually was summering probably about eight miles from me. And when I shot him, a lot of the local guys from that area thought I'd actually poached him somewhere else. Uh, but what happens in Iowa, here's my philosophy. Usually pressure, your pressure is my best friend. I normally steer clear, let the crops come down and let people start hunting and let that pressure happen. And these bucks hit these, these fence lines and these creek bottoms and they just start running to cover. And I try to hunt in the thick stuff. And so this buck, I was actually with a guy that had never filmed a whitetail hunt. Uh, he was with me doing something for Hoyt, actually a Hoyt project. And I told him, uh, I told him to practice a little bit, filming some stuff. And I told him I was going to rattle. So I rattled and I heard something coming through the corn right away. And I looked up and it was, you know, this little 115 inch eight point. And I just said, all right, dude, I go get on him, get some good film and all that stuff. And I was just trying to stay tight, you know, try to get my antlers between my legs and grab my bow and just be still. And I ended up turning over to him. He was right over my shoulder and he was like facing the wrong way. And I go, dude, practice filming the buck right here so you know what to do. And he just, and he, he like looks over to it and he said, well, the one beneath us is way bigger. And I look down and Here's my target buck came to antlers in literally 10 minutes time and just one of the most awesome six by sixes I've ever shot and this is a really cool buck. Uh, I shot with one of my great friends super thankful but just an awesome awesome buck and this is pretty much one of those mule deer where the way this went down, I was up in Alberta. We were just kind of out looking around and ended up seeing a pretty nice muley. It had just kind of came out of the out of the river bottom area, was feeding along the edge. We made this awesome stalk, got within range. I think I think the other buck was about 50 yards. I popped up, got a couple ranges. I was getting all ready to shoot. And then all of a sudden I look over and I only saw the rack from the side, never saw any of the good stuff. I just said, here comes another buck. And I ranged him, he was 40, so bird in the hand. When he popped out and ended up turning, I was on my knees, I drew back and he ended up coming in. Uh, I shot him at seven yards right in the chest. Every step he came closer, I started to realize what the heck this thing was. When he went away, I had I got to see this thing from the back. I thought, well, you might as well stop mule deer hunting from here on out. But yeah, double droppers, double kickers, just an un unreal mule deer, so. All right, this is my personal office. This was one of my first Canadian moose and shot this with one of my most valuable mentors uh, that I have for the backcountry. His name was Bert. Uh, I was with Bert on this this bull, 
means a lot to me. This was a, this is a giant bull right here. This is a, a big, big, heavy, like dense bull. Shot him square in the chest at seven yards, about ready to walk over the top of me too. Uh, so that's a cool bull. This is a very, very amazing deer right here. Uh, I keep this one close to me. So this, this is actually a 200, this is a 200 gross whitetail right here. It's really hard to appreciate this thing unless you're holding it, but just an absolute gagger of a buck. Um, when I shot this, I was with one of my, well, I was with several of my closest friends and honestly, they knew that I didn't like score and they went out, uh, had a score go out. They wanted to score it. And honestly, I just said, I don't want to hear it because I had already fallen short of that mark on the other buck. So I was like, I don't want to hear it. I'm just going to go in and, and celebrate. And he came out and said, well, there's good news and there's bad news. Which do you want first? And I said, tell me the good news. <laughs> Cause I thought the bad news was he wasn't going to make it. The good news was that this, that I had shot a 200 inch white tail. The bad news was I was going to have to buy replicas because my buddy wanted one. And I knew that I wanted one because I honestly wanted to be able to keep this, to hold it and look at it. And it's freaking unbelievable. I love this white tail. All right, everybody, welcome to Knock On HQ. So uh, this was our very first building right here. It was actually my chiropractor, uh, but I bought it. Let's um, come in the first offices here for those of you who have seen her at all the total archery challenges and and on tv this is sharon she runs knock on so this is her domain in here but sharon's got some cool stuff uh this was a giant black bear that she shot we actually got a half mount on it and but it was the biggest black bear I think I'd ever like walked up to when, when it was like time. I think at the time it was like one of the top uh, bears that had been shot by a female with a bow. So half rack is my wife's first whitetail buck. And she had hunted 700 hours before she finally got this opportunity. We call them half rack because the year prior, I called Sharon, drop here off at school, put your camo in the car and get here. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you in right to this stand. There's a buck here. It's like a perfect buck, he's awesome. And I'm like, you're gonna have a 15 yard shot. She came over and next thing I know, I hear the grunting, I hear the chasing and I said, just pull back. They're gonna be right there 15 yards. And she pulls back and she's ready and here they come. And all of a sudden I'm like, bah, and get them to stop. One side is completely gone. So Sharon just looks at me and she's like, he only has half a rack. Naturally, I'm like, yeah, but it's a really good half. <laughs> and she just said, I haven't waited this long for only half a rack, she said, I'll, I'll, I'll wait. Fast forward to the next year, the day before gun season, here half rack steps out in front of her blind. She makes a sweet shot and that's the story of half rack. So Sharon put in 700 hours for her first bow hunt whitetail and well worth the wait.